So I got to tell you, you want to know what I did today? I drove a combine. I did. I did. So, you know, when I was governor, we had, we're a big agricultural state. And so I had driven a combine simulator before. But thanks to Dennis, I actually got to drive the combine. And I've decided I want to be him when I grow up. <laughs> because to be able to get in there, I would blast on Joan Jett and I would have a field day on your fields. I'm telling you that. It's great to be here. Happy harvest time to all of you. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself because I see a lot of new faces. And then we're going to talk about our country and how we're going to fix her. And then we're going to open it up for questions. And there's nothing I won't answer. So you can be thinking about what it is you want to talk about. I was born and raised in a small rural town in South Carolina. 2,500 people, two stoplights. You couldn't think about doing something wrong without somebody already telling your mom. But it was a great way to grow up because you learn neighbors take care of neighbors. That's the way we, we grew up. My mom started a business out of the living room of our home. 30 plus years later, it was a successful company. I started doing the books for the family business when I was 13. It wasn't until I got to college that I realized that was child labor. <laughs> I went on to, I'm not an Ivy Leaguer, I went on to a public university, Clemson University, go Tigers. Don't judge us on that game with Duke. Don't judge us on that. And so I am an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. Accountants are problem solvers. Went on and worked in the corporate world, and then I came back home to the family business. And one day I happened to be telling my mom how hard it was to make a dollar and how easy it was for government to take it. And my mom said, quit complaining about it. Do something about it. I did not know you weren't supposed to run against a 30-year incumbent in a primary. Truly, ignorance is bliss. Once I realized he was related to half the district, the only option was to win. And so I went around the district and said, we have way too many lawyers in the state house. I think they need a really good accountant. The district took a chance on me and we won. And I got to work. And in South Carolina, a lot of bills were passed by a voice vote. All in favor, say aye, all opposed, nay, the ayes have it. But one day they passed a bill that would give themselves a pay raise. All in favor, say aye. All opposed, silence. The ayes have it. Yet to this day, you can't find anyone that says they voted themselves a pay raise. <laughs> I was furious because we had a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican governor. So I filed a bill that said anything important enough to be debated on the floor of the House or the Senate is important enough for legislators to have to show their vote on the record. And the Speaker of the House came to me and said, put the bill away. We don't need to have it. We will decide what the public needs to see and what they don't. I didn't put the bill away. Instead, I went around the state and told everybody what was happening. And in return, they stripped me of everything. They stripped me of my seniority. They stripped me of all of my committee assignments. So I ran for governor. <laughs> And I'm proud to say one of the first bills we signed into law when I became governor is now in South Carolina. Anything debated on the floor of the House or the Senate requires a legislative vote on the record. And we took it a step further and did it on every section of the budget. And as you know, I love music because you were listening to my playlist. And so on the day of the bill signing, we blasted throughout the State House. Pat Benatar's hit me with your best shot. <laughs> When I became governor, South Carolina was hurting. We had 11% unemployment. We had thousands of people on welfare. South Carolina was the butt of the jokes. And so we got to work. By the time I left, we were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes-Benz. We brought in Volvo, five international tire companies. And yes, they were referring to us as the beast of the Southeast, which I still love. We announced jobs in every county in the state, and we said, if you have to show picture ID to buy Sudafed, if you've got to show a picture ID to get on a plane, you should have to show a picture ID to protect the integrity of the election process. <laughs> we 
We passed voter ID in South Carolina. We passed one of the toughest illegal immigration laws in the country. We announced jobs in every county in the state, and by the time I left, we were named the friendliest state in the country, the most patriotic state in the country, and the number two state in the country people were moving to. And then I got the call for the United Nations. And my honest answer was, I don't even know what the UN does. I just know everybody hates it, <laughs> which is true. But when you get the chance to serve your country, you jump. So when I got to the UN, I wanted countries to know what America was for and what America was against. I didn't care if they didn't like me, but I wanted them to respect America. And so we got to work. We pulled ourselves out of the Iran deal. We moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I negotiated with China and Russia to pass the largest set of sanctions against a country in a generation with North Korea. But the biggest thing that we did, the most important thing that we did, was we took the kick me sign off of our backs and America was respected again at the United Nations. Now I'm running for president and I don't need to tell you how bad things are. You don't have to turn on the news to feel it. You feel it when you go to the grocery store. You feel it when you fill your car up with gas. Now, I would love to tell you that we're in this situation because Biden did that to us. We are $32 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. Biden has sent us into this socialism creep that we're watching happen in our country. But our Republicans did this to us too. You go back and you look. I will let you clap at that because that is true. You go back and look at that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill that they passed with no accountability. It expanded welfare that has now left us with 90 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. And did they try and correct it? No. Nope. They opened up earmarks for the first time in 10 years, pushing through 7,000 of them. The 2024 budget just came out. In the last budget, do you want to know how they spent your money? $30 million on an honors college in Vermont. $10 million to tear down a hotel in Alaska. $7.5 million on a courthouse in Colorado. And the list goes on. And in the 2024 appropriations budget, Republicans put in $7.4 billion worth of pet projects and earmarks. Democrats put in $2.8 billion. Now you tell me who the big spenders are. All while one in six American families can't afford their utility bill, 60% of Americans are in credit card debt, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 50% of American families can't afford diapers. Social Security will go bankrupt in 10 years. Medicare will go bankrupt in eight. You look at our education system, everybody wants to blame COVID for education. We had problems with education before COVID. Pre-COVID, 67% of eighth graders in our country were not proficient in reading or math. Think about that. A couple of months ago, it came out that over 80% are not proficient in history or civics. And now two weeks ago, they tell us our 13-year-olds are scoring the lowest that they've seen in reading and math in decades. Something's got to give, right? Yet they want to focus on biological boys playing in girls' sports? I had a daughter that ran track in high school. I don't even know how I would have that conversation with her. How do we get our girls used to being in a locker room with biological boys? You can't. You look at the border situation, and I'll tell you, I've been to the border, and I didn't pull a comma and go and come back. I went 400 miles down that border. You're not ready for what I saw. Mounds of clothes. Mounds paraphernalia, rape areas that the women and girls have to go through. When you get up in the morning, you get your coffee and you watch the news. When these ranchers get up in the morning, they get their coffee and they see if anyone died crossing the fence. They pick up whatever little kids were left behind and they turn them over to Border Patrol. 
I met with multiple sheriffs. They said before 7 a.m. they round up whatever illegal immigrants they can find. They turn them over to Border Patrol. Border Patrol documents them and releases them until their court date years from now. And when I asked Border Patrol about their job, they said, you want to know what we do? We're glorified babysitters. They don't let us do our job. Five and a half million illegal immigrants have crossed that border. We had enough fentanyl cross the border last year that would kill every single American. Number one cause of death for adults 18 to 45, fentanyl. And don't think for a second China doesn't know what they're doing when they send it over. My parents always taught us, you take care of those who take care of you. I'm going to ask you for taking care of those who take care of us. Right now in America, 33,000 veterans are homeless. One in three veterans suffers from PTSD or thoughts of suicide. We lose 22 heroes a day to suicide. The average amount of time for a veteran to get a doctor's appointment at the VA, 29 days. Why 29 days? Because on the 30th day, they can go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. So midway through the 29 days, they call and reschedule, and the clock starts all over again. It's shameful. So that's a lot of bad, right? It's hard to find any good. But now I'm going to tell you what I told South Carolinians when I became governor. No more whining. No more complaining. Now we get to work. How do we fix it? When it comes to the economy, let's start by clawing back the $500 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are out there. Instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, let's go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud that we know exists. A dollar out of every seven was spent fraudulently. If we know that 8% of our budget is interest, quit borrowing, cut up the credit cards. They're spending like drunken sailors. You have to balance a budget every day. I had to balance a budget as governor. Why is Congress the only group that refuses to balance a budget? We will stop the spending, we'll stop the borrowing, we will eliminate the earmarks, and I will veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. We will take the agencies in the federal government and we'll start moving all of those programs down to the states. By doing that, you're reducing the size of the federal government and you're empowering the people in the states. That's what we need to do to get things back on track and that's how we'll get our economy back on track. If we don't, our kids will never forgive us for this. When you look at education in South Carolina, we knew if a child couldn't read by third grade, they were four times less likely to graduate high school. So we started holding those kids back. We brought in reading remediation programs. We started working with their parents and we set them up for success. We need to do that across our country. We have to make sure our kids can read. This is gonna go into a dangerous situation where we won't have kids graduate from high school. We need to make sure there should never be a parent who wonders what's being said or taught to their child in the classroom. We need complete transparency for parents with our children in the classroom. We have one job, one job, and that's to get it right for our kids, and we need to do that. We are not going to turn over custody of our kids to a teacher's union or a school bureaucrat. We also need to make sure parents can decide which schools their kids go to. Every child deserves a good education. No child should be mandated based on where they're born and raised. We need school choice in this country. And let's start building things in America again. Let's put vocational classes back into our high schools. I had apprenticeships. We had apprenticeships all over South Carolina. We taught our kids how to build the things we were making in South Carolina. And let's never forget that we need to raise strong girls. Yes, strong boys too, but we really need to raise strong girls because strong girls become strong women. 
Strong women become strong leaders. We start by making sure we don't have biological boys playing in girls' sports. We have to deal with that. <laughs> Ladies, I just want to throw this out to you. Did you see Johns Hopkins gave out the definition of a woman? You're not ready. You know what it is? A non-man. A non-man. Don't let them erase us like that. When it comes to the border, we will do the same thing we did in South Carolina, but we'll take it national. We need to do a national E-Verify program where businesses have to decide, have to show that everyone that they have hired is here legally. We need to defund sanctuary cities once and for all. Instead of those 87,000 IRS agents, let's put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We'll go back to the Remain in Mexico policy because nobody wants to remain in Mexico. And instead of catch and release, we'll go to catch and deport. That's how we'll stop the bleeding. And don't let anyone tell you we can't do two things at one time. Yes, we will close off the border, but when it comes to legal immigration, stop with the quotas. Let's start doing it based on merit. Go to our industries and see what workers they need. Think farmers, think construction, think tourism. And let's make sure that when they need workers, we bring them here and it's done on merit so that it builds up our economy. That's the way you do legal immigration. And when it comes to our veterans, we need to really think about what we expect, what they expect of us or what we should be doing for them. I'm the wife of a combat veteran. My husband deployed to Afghanistan. And the media does a great job of showing when they leave with the tears and when they come home with the hugs. And it's a blessed day when they come home. But that's the easy part. The hard part is when we actually go home. The transition is tough. My husband came home and he couldn't hear loud noises. He couldn't be in crowds. Life had passed him by for the year that he was gone and the transition was tough. We can't just love our military men and women when they're gone. We owe it to them to love them when they come back home too. We will do better with the transition. We will make sure we have telehealth so that they can get real-time mental health care when they need it. We will let them go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. And the way we're going to fix the health care system for our veterans is we're going to make every member of Congress have to get their health care from the VA. And you watch how fast that gets fixed. <laughs> It'll be the best health care you've ever seen. <laughs> so we have that. But look, Congress could have done any of those things, right? What has Congress done for you lately? It is why we have to have term limits in Washington, D.C. It's time. It is why we need to have mental health, mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75. see some of you don't be like that because this is not being disrespectful. We all know smart, strong 75-year-olds that are very effective. And then we know Joe Biden. <laughs> These are people that are making decisions on our national security. These are people that are making decisions on our children's future economy. We need to know they're at the top of their game. It's important. So that's the domestic side of things. Now let's talk about national security.
Did you ever think we'd look at the sky and see a Chinese spy balloon looking back at us? It's a national embarrassment. You've got Russia invading Ukraine. You've got Iran building a bomb. You've got North Korea testing ballistic missiles. You've got China on the march. But make no mistake, that never would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. The idea that my husband Michael and his military brothers and sisters who served there had to watch us leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that told our friends. More importantly, think about the message that sent to our enemies. And speaking of enemies, China has been preparing for war with us for years. And that's not being dramatic. They're already here. They've already infiltrated. They've purchased 400,000 acres of U.S. soil. You know that very well. Most recently near Grand Forks Air Force Base, where our most sensitive drone technology is. But also with these farms, don't ever forget, food security is national security. Then you go and you look at the fact that they have spent millions of dollars going into our universities, stealing our research and spreading Chinese propaganda. They, barged, they bought the largest pork producer in the country, right here in the state of Iowa. They are using their Chinese companies to lobby our members of Congress on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. If you look at the fentanyl that's come across, more Americans have died from fentanyl than the Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam wars combined. We lost 75,000 last year alone of Americans from fentanyl. The technology that they need, there is certain technology they need because it builds up their military and it threatens America. Of that technology, the Biden administration approved 70 percent of that last year. Ninety percent of our law enforcement drones are Chinese. So you panicked over a Chinese spy balloon. Think about all of those many spy balloons that are all over our country that can capture that data. And then look at how they've built up their military. They have the largest naval fleet in the world. They have 350 ships. They're going to have 400 ships in two years. We won't even have 350 ships in two decades. They're doing, they're doing space. They're doing artificial intelligence. They're doing cyber. They've developed hypersonic missiles. We've barely gotten started. They are now the largest developer of neurostrike weapons, weapons that are engineered to change the mental capacity of military commanders and segments of the population. That's who we're dealing with. So when Biden and his cabinet members talk about them being a competitor, they don't see us as a competitor. They see us as an enemy. We've got to change the way we look at them. But we can fix this. We just have to wake up. The way we'll fix it, we're not going to let the Chinese buy any more of our U.S. soil, and we're going to take back what they've already purchased. <laughs> when it comes to our universities, we're going to tell them, you either take Chinese money or you take American money. But the days of taking both are over. <laughs> we'll get that Chinese infiltration out of our schools. We will stop all foreign lobbying, period. We don't need to have foreign actors lobbying our members of Congress. That's what ambassadors are for. We'll end that practice altogether. With the fentanyl that's coming across the border, we will tell China we're going to end all normal trade relations with you until you stop killing Americans. You watch how fast they move when we say that to them. And we'll send our military special operation forces to take out the cartel, because we're not waiting on Mexico anymore. <laughs> the technology list, rather than having that approved, you blacklist that technology. We don't need to send China anything that's going to threaten America. And when it comes to our military, we need a strong military. We need a modernized military. Strong militaries don't start wars. Strong militaries prevent wars. 
And the way you do that is you make sure that we focus on what it takes to make sure our men and women are ready. We no longer look at wars that are going to be land, air, and sea. You now have to add and make sure we're ready for artificial intelligence, cyber, and space. We have to be ready for the next type. But when you do that, that's when you strengthen us. That doesn't mean you throw a bunch of money at the Department of Defense. You actually need to bring down the red tape and the bureaucracy and make sure the money actually goes to modernize the equipment and the services that we need. And for goodness sake, we have got to stop with these gender pronoun classes that are happening in the military. It's demoralizing to them. And there were two things that China and Russia never wanted us to have when I was at the UN. They didn't want us to have a strong military, and they didn't want us to be energy independent. Not only will we, will we be energy independent, we'll be energy dominant. And all of the above energy approach, no more going hat in hand to Saudi Arabia, no more getting dirty oil from Iran and Venezuela. So we have the answers. We know what we need to do to get our country back on track. But the first thing that we need to tackle is we need to end the national self-loathing that has taken over our country. The idea that they say America's bad or rotten or racist. I was elected the first female minority governor in history. America's not racist, we're blessed. Our children need to know to love America. They need to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance when they start school every day. Two months ago, I dropped my husband off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they'd never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to fight for us there, shouldn't we be willing to fight for America here? Because we have a country to save. Do you remember when you were growing up how simple life was? Do you remember how safe it felt? It was about faith, family, and country. Your parents raised you to be responsible individuals. You went to school and you learned what it meant to be successful. You went to church and you found your faith and your conscience. Don't you want that again? Because we could have that again. But in order to have that, we've got to acknowledge some hard truths. Republicans have lost the last seven out of eight popular votes for president. That's nothing to be proud of. We should want to win the majority of Americans. We have to remember it is time for a new generational leader. We've got to leave the negativity and the drama of the past, and we need to take on these new issues with new solutions. You know, someone asked me when I first started running for president why I was running. And I said, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for my husband, Michael, and his military brothers and sisters because they need to know their sacrifice matters. They need to know we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter because she just got married and I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. And I'm doing this for my son who's a senior in college and I am tired of watching him write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That's not us. That's not America. And for the first time, 78% of Americans 
don't think their kids are going to live as good of a life as we did. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We do have a country to save. But I'll make you this promise. If you will join me today, if you will seriously invest in this fight, we can change the track that we're on. But it's going to take a lot of courage. Courage from every person in this room. Courage for me to run. And courage for every one of you to know, don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't play in this caucus. It matters. It matters. So thank you for taking the time to come out on a Friday to hang out with me and listen to me. But I will tell you, join us in this fight, and I will run a race that makes you proud. But more than that, we will see the best days our country has to offer when we join together and we finish this. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Andrew, is it just you? So we've got Andrew and Miles. They have microphones. If you'll raise your hand, they will find you. And again, there's nothing I won't answer. You may not like my answer, but there's nothing I won't answer. Hello, Ms. Haley. Hi, how are Hi. you? My name is Jim Barton. I'm uh, from Lexington, South Carolina, and I also attended Clemson. Oh, go Tigers uh, and Lexington. I love the, that. Uh, I want you to be the president. But I'm, and I think you can win a general election. That's what most of us believe. You're electable, but can you win, get the, the nomination? And just break from the base. Break from Trump's base. I mean, just, you will never be their candidate. Just throw them away. And let the rest of America know who you are and the incredible governor you are. It's, all I hear is, the, all the ads I see about you or their foreign policy stuff, which is great. But you were the best governor we ever had in South Carolina. Thank you. And you, I hear nothing about it. Okay, and that's the, the, the only other thing I've got, is I've got a daughter here who was terrified to go to school because of the school shootings. What can we do? Okay, so that was a lot. Um, first, I'm going to say thank you. I love the fact that you were from the area I represented in the State House and from the state that I love. Um, so thank you for the question. Okay, a couple of things. You said, why don't I break from the base? I have had people say, I love Trump too much. And I've had people say, I hate Trump too much. The truth is, I speak hard truths. I agree with a lot of Trump's policies. I am proud of the work that I did at the UN and working with him. I had a great working relationship with him. And the reason I was able to get out of there without a tweet was because I told him the truth. When he was doing something good, I rallied, I supported, I wanted America to be strong. And when I thought he was going in the wrong direction, I showed up in his office or I picked up the phone and I would say, you can't do this, but instead you could do X, Y, or Z. I always gave him options. And he would say, how do you see that playing out? And he liked the fact that I wasn't a yes person because he knew I saved him on a couple of things. I don't agree with Trump 100% of the time. I don't disagree with him 100% of the time. That's the same way I feel about my husband. So, <laughs> but what I will always tell you is the truth. So where do I disagree on Trump, if you want to talk about that? Where do I disagree on Trump? I think that they spent like drunken sailors, and I think our kids aren't going to forgive us for it, and I think $8 trillion fell on his watch, and I think we've got to start paying attention to the fact that these are tax dollars that we, need to, that we are spending. I think he and a couple of other candidates who have said that the Ukraine-Russia issue is a territorial dispute and we should hand it over to Russia is incredibly wrong. And the reason is 
A win for Russia is a win for China. They've proven that time and time again. And when you look at the fact that we have only spent three and a half percent, three and a half percent of our defense budget, percentage of GDP, we've only spent percentage of GDP, 11 European countries have spent more than us. That's a pretty good return on investment to prevent war. Because Putin said once Ukraine is done, he's going after Poland and the Baltics, and that's a full-on war. We are trying to prevent war. I'm a military spouse. The last thing I want is my husband to go to war or any military families to go to war. The third thing, he thinks January 6th was a beautiful day. I think it was a terrible day. I hope it never happens again. So there are things we disagree on, but there's a lot I agree with him on, too. So I will always tell you the truth. That's my promise. So it's not me being about the base or not about the base. I actually think they've divided our country by talking about a base. We're Americans. And at the end of the day, Americans just want to know government's working for them and not the other way around. Now, when it comes to school shootings, and with your daughter, and I have a mom heart. My daughter is a nurse at the Children's Hospital in South Carolina, and I worry about her. My son is on a college campus, and every morning and every night, I think about both of my kids and what could happen. If we want to deal with school shootings, we need to talk hard truths, because you have a lot of illegal guns out there, and ask our law enforcement, you know why? They'll arrest them for the illegal guns, but they go and let these people back out the next day. We need to prosecute according to the law and hold these people accountable. That's how you get all those stolen guns off the street. The second thing, so we have to deal with street crime. The second thing is America has refused to acknowledge the cancer in our country that is mental health. One in four Americans suffers from a mental health issue. But if treated, they can live a perfectly normal life. The problem is, we don't have enough therapists out there. And if you can't find a therapist, we don't have enough mental health treatment centers. And if you have an issue and you don't get treated, you can fall into addiction. We don't have enough addiction centers out there. And if you happen to be lucky enough to get one of those three, insurance doesn't cover any of it. So families can't afford it. 80% of our mass shootings have been mental health related. We have to start dealing with that cancer. We're losing Americans every day, and it's causing more places to be dangerous. Now, with the schools, we should be protecting our schools like we protect our courthouses and our airports. There should be one mode of entry into a school. No other doors opening, no side doors, no rear doors. We should have a law enforcement officer at the front of every school, public or private. We need to do that. We need to make sure there is a mental health counselor on the ground in every school so they can spot these kids that are struggling and help them get help. And then we need to make sure that we put the secure tape on the windows. That sounds awful, but you got to do it. If you do it in a courthouse and you do it in an airport, why wouldn't you do it in our schools? It will make such a difference. But if you're talking about guns, full disclosure, I'm a concealed weapons permit holder myself. You don't take guns away from good people who want to protect themselves. <laughs> Ask those people in Pennsylvania when that murderer was on the loose. Thank goodness some of them had guns because that's how they got him out of their houses. I could go and tell you today, I'm going to take, get rid of a certain kind of gun. You pick it. And it would make you feel good today. There'd be another shooting next week. Let's do the hard work. Let's do it right. Let's secure our schools. Let's deal with mental health, but let's allow people to continue to be free and protect themselves. I'm going to do that for you, I promise, because the mom in me knows that there's a lot more than just your daughter that are worried about these shootings, but we're going to do it the right way, and we're going to do it in a way that's long-lasting, that really gets us safe again. I can't here, see. I know you say over here, but I don't know where over right, here. Right, right. To your right. Oh.
There you go. Okay. Hi, Sorry. Governor Haley. My name is Cole Bennett. It's such a pleasure to see you. Thank, thank you. you for being out here. Thank you to your husband, Michael, for his service. Thank you. And thank you for your service to our country and wanting to run. Thank you. Um, I'm a nurse. And as a nurse, I'm deeply concerned about the future of healthcare in this country, specifically for our seniors. We've got healthcare corporations that are conglomerating, that are leaving our rural communities to the wayside. By the year 2050, over 20% 20 of the U.S. population is going to be over the age of 65. I'm telling you right now, we don't have the workforce for that. All the while, as you said, Social Security is going to go solvent in 10 years. So what will the Haley administration do to mend our broken health care system so that seniors can retire with dignity? Thank you. Well, and God bless you for what you do. I mean, y'all really are, I will say, our nurses and our medical professionals, y'all are angels on earth. So thank you for what you do. My daughter is a nurse, so I can totally relate to you. We have a health care system. Think about this. We're the best country in the world with the most expensive health care. It doesn't make sense. The only way to fix this is we have to open it all up. And I mean make every ounce of it transparent. I want to open up everything about the insurance companies, the hospitals, the doctors, the PBMs, the pharmaceutical companies across the board and make them show us things. And I'll tell you why. I take care of my parents. They live with us. They're 87 and 89 and my dad just got out of the hospital. The idea that he comes home to a hospital bill that he had no conversations with anyone about, but that the insurance company and the hospital decided to negotiate for him without him even knowing what he paid for is criminal. When my mom was in the hospital, they went to bring her two Tylenol. She said, I don't need it. They said, honey, you might as well take it. You're going to pay for it anyway. That's wrong. When we go to get our car fixed, what happens? We go and the auto mechanic says, well, I can do a quick fix and it'll just cost you this or I can do the real fix and it's going to cost you more. But you make that decision. If we just dealt with the insurance companies, we'd cut health care costs in half. So what I'm going to do, we are going to expose all of it. We're going to expose all of it and we're going to put the patient in the driver's seat. This is not rocket science. This is about the fact you have to know who your consumer is. Your consumer is the patient. The next thing is doctors don't give you those 10 tests because they want to. It's for the 90% chance they get sued. We need tort reform across this country. I did it in South Carolina. Tort reform will bring down those costs of health care, and then we need to have competition in health care. We have, and I don't know if you've heard, certificate of need. We had that in South Carolina, and we eliminated it. Certificate of need is nothing but protectionist. What happens is a hospital says you can't build another hospital within X miles of here. Well, what happens is there's no competition. You get rid of certificate of need. When I was growing up in our family's business, my mom would always say the best thing that could happen to us is if our competitor went across the street because the quality would go up, the services would go up, and the cost would go down for the consumer. We need to have competition in healthcare and transparency in healthcare, and that's how I'll fix it. And guess what that means for you at the end of the day? Your salary is going to go up, and you won't have nurses leaving the job. You'll have nurses that want to come to the job. All right. I see you in the back. All right. We have time for one more question. Oh, make it a good one. I'll try my best. Thank you for coming here, Nikki. Thank you. You're in the Midwest. This is agriculture country. The renewable fuel standard is important to us. We grow corn and soybeans. Corn we make ethanol out of. Soybeans we make renewable biodiesel. diesel. Yeah. Renewable diesel and biodiesel. But renewable diesel is kind of the new thing that's come out. Without the renewable fuel standard support by the federal government and by our president, it hurts economic development in the state of Iowa, and it's also partly a national uh, security thing with homegrown fuel here in the Midwest for the United States. I want to know what your support is for the renewable fuel standard and uh, if you'll 
support us through everything that you can do in the federal government as president. I had someone say, oh, you say those things because you grew up in an agricultural state, and agriculture was our number one industry in South Carolina. I grew up playing in cotton fields and on a dairy farm. But I know one, two basic truths that you can't take away. Food security is national security. Energy dominance is national security. We will do both of those. My energy side is an all of the above approach. We need to do it. I don't want us dependent on anyone else for that. And we're going to do everything we can to support you with consistency. And that includes the E15 year round. We're going to make sure we do all of that. But it's because you have to look at your farmers as partners. You don't look at them as you're giving aid. You look at it as it's economic development. Not only do I want to do that, I want to sell what you've got. I want to make sure not only are we selling it around the country, but we get the EPA to back off and quit worrying about sagebrush lizards and all those other things. We get them to stop doing all these water regs that they're doing when you're just trying to do your job. And I will focus on how do we sell what you're making overseas too. I want everybody buying what we have. If we can be so blessed that we can feed our families here in America, that we can help with energy sources here in America, then we want to do enough and more so that we can also export it and strengthen our economy. So you've got me in every way all day because I think you're going to be a great economic development partner and I think opportunities lie with farmers. They always have and with me they always will. So thank you for taking the time to be with me today. I want to leave you with this. When I ran for that House seat in the very beginning and ran against that 30-year incumbent in a primary, people laughed at me. And I got to work, and I earned their support, and we won. When I ran for governor, I ran against a lieutenant governor, an attorney general, a very popular congressman, and a state senator. I was Nikki Hu. I had 3% in the polls. I had the least amount of money. But I worked South Carolina like no one else, and we won. When I got to the United Nations, they said I didn't have enough experience. And I got to work, and I took the kick me sign off of our backs, and we were respected again. I have been underestimated in everything I've ever done. And it's a blessing, because it makes me scrappy. Get used to this face, because no one's going to outwork me in this race. No one's going to outsmart me in this race, because we have a country to save. But you have a caucus. So this is what I'll tell you. If you like what I've had to say, what I had to say today, go tell 10 people. Tell them to go to NikkiHaley.com. Tell them to caucus for us. Tell them to volunteer for us. Tell them to pitch in five, 10, $25. We can do this. We will do this. You mark my words. We will do this. And you'll look like a star at the end of it. I promise. <laughs> you don't like what I've had to say today. Shh. Just don't say anything and don't tell anyone you were here. God bless you. Thank you very much.